Okay, so so what you've probably been reading in the newspapers, um, uh, and some of this is a little bit dated, but on April the 23rd, uh, there was a headline in the Star, uh, was legal battles loom as businesses hit by the virus to sue insurers, uh, written by an AP writer. Uh, yesterday, there was an article in one of the, my insurance journals that <clears throat> a pretty well-known uh, restaurant chain in Boston called Legal Seafood filed suit against their insurance company uh, to try to force them to pro provide coverage. So the, the conventional wisdom, uh, getting back, uh, Kerry, to, to, to the question that you're asking, uh, the conventional wisdom is, is and, and we'll start with, with business interruption. Everybody's, everybody's calling our office and I'm sure every other insurance agent down saying, do I have business interruption coverage? Well, maybe, maybe not, but you probably, most of you probably have uh, business interruption coverage on your policy. But then you have to, to, to read the policy to see that what triggers that coverage is direct physical damage to covered property by a covered cause of loss. So then we get into the debate about whether or not the virus itself constitutes direct physical damage. And, and uh, some lawyers say yes, some lawyers say no. Uh, most insurance companies are taking the position at this point uh, that the answer is no. Um, but the, the, the other thing is, uh, uh, is, are there any exclusions in the policy uh, that would negate uh, the coverage? And the answer is in many policies, there is a virus exclusion. Matter of fact, I have, I have one um, client uh, that just renewed their policy on uh, March, early in March, I guess it was. Uh, and because of the fact that the existence of the virus was known at that time, the, the insurance companies not only included an exclusion for viruses, they, they specifically named COVID-19. So absolutely excluding coverage. And uh, of course you read in the newspapers, particularly with, uh, with restaurants, uh, the, the guy that owns the uh, famous restaurant in Napa uh, and, uh, and then one of the famous uh, chefs uh, in central California are saying, I've been paying for business interruption coverage for years and now my business has been interrupted. Uh, yeah, your business has been interrupted, but but was it because of a of direct physical damage to your covered property by a covered cause of loss? So so therein lies the question. Uh, the answers uh, in the beginning of this whole discussion uh, were pretty much of a no. Uh, the the carriers are all saying no, there's no coverage, uh, but things are evolving. Uh, you know, there are several states now that have introduce legislation uh, to force the carriers to uh, provide coverage uh, because the, the, the insureds uh, felt that they had been paying for coverage all along, which uh, to, to clarify that, there has never been any coverage contemplated by any of these policies. And in fact, there's never been any premiums paid to obtain that coverage. So very generally there hasn't been coverage, but but it's it's a big problem, uh, and and legislators in several states, including uh, uh, New Jersey and Michigan and, and a number of others, have introduced legislation to force the carriers to pay. In addition to that, you've got, as I mentioned, the guy that uh, these these chefs are all suing uh, their carriers to force them to uh, to provide coverage. So. Obviously, all of that stuff is in its early stages. Um, so we don't know whether or not uh, the carriers are going to be forced to pay. But uh, one of the key points uh, in this whole progression of, of events is that um, the uh, entire surplus of the United States insurance industry as of the end of last year, 12 19 
was approximately $847 billion. The losses right now for businesses, uh, small businesses, is between 255 billion and 431 billion per month. So you can you can see that the 847 billion surplus of the entire industry would be wiped out in a couple of months. So if the legislation and or the litigation ends up forcing uh, the insurance companies to pay, uh, I mean, I, it just seems only logical that the government would have to get involved and subsidize this thing. Because I don't think the, the country can afford to be without the insurance industry. So it, it's a very difficult, it's a, it's a very difficult question. Um, there, right now, there are $6 billion per month being paid in premiums for property insurance. And if the losses are $255 billion on the low end, uh, it hardly uh, provides any any money for coverage. So that's kind of the stage as it has been set. Uh, there, there are lawsuits going back and forth. Uh, you know, I, I, I've been talking for a few minutes now, and I know Dell may have some questions, and he's got to leave. But why don't we just open it up and uh, and just have a kind of a roundtable discussion, and you guys can uh, ask me what uh, you want to ask about this. I have a couple of questions, Jack. One is, um, what does this mean for us and, and our sort of umbrella liability going forward? Um, you know, we put on a public event. Well, yeah, it, it's so Dell, there, there is event cancellation coverage out there. So I, I've, so far I've only been talking about business interruption as it right. relates to an ongoing business, but that it, it's an excellent question that you ask. So for a bowl game uh, or a concert, or, or some other uh, uh, one-time kind of event or, or, or a limited type of event in terms of time, uh, there is event cancellation coverage. Uh, to be honest with you, I haven't looked at your policy yet to see uh, whether that's in there. Uh, but uh, hopefully by the time the bowl rolls around, we're, uh, uh, we're gonna be out of this. Although I don't know if Ali's is, a, is, a, is a, Optimistic as I am. <laughs> um, you said you had a couple of questions. The other question I have is, um, in our case, assuming our event goes forward as planned, what does that mean for our liability if we have the public attending? Um, is there talk about that in the industry? Well, you know what's interesting about that is, is, uh, is uh, I don't know if you saw, uh, there was some sniping going on between the, the parties about when when uh, the Senate reconvened uh, the other day that one of the one of the uh, topics they were going to take up was limiting liability for this thing. So uh, part of the answer to your question is going to, to be uh, what uh, the Senate and well what Congress decides about limiting liability for businesses for this type of thing. Uh, certainly, um, uh, there, there are discussions about, uh, you know, testing, chem uh, you know, as people come through the tur turnstiles, they have to use uh, a, a, one of those devices to, to take their temperature before they come into the stadium. Uh, or if anybody is physically, uh, visibly uh, ill, you know, letting them into the stadium. I, I, you know, uh, liability is always based on negligence. And I think there, there's going to be some reasonable uh, standards uh, that are going to have to be established to, to where liability can be assigned. Certainly, if, if, if your business or any business is negligent in, in allowing people to gather together that, where there's known exposure to the virus, uh, you could be, at, le at least at this point, you could be held liable. But I think the, the, the legislators are taking that subject up. Yeah, it, it applies to a retail store, uh, applies to restaurants, applies to a bowl game. Uh, I, I think it's gonna boil it down to what, what standards we have in place at the time uh, this happens and, uh, and what the le legislators decide to do. Thank you. You bet.
Hi, so, Aaron. I was going to say, ask some questions. We're asking questions, so please go ahead if you feel free to. Okay. Um, we have an event coming up September 26th. Sorry, my name's Aaron. I'm with the American Heart Association. Hi, um, and um, we have an event coming up in September at the Hilton. And I don't know, you know, whether September 26th is still too soon to be in person. I just thought maybe you would have some insight. In terms of when uh, the uh, uh, crowds are going to be able to assemble again, I use the word crowd loosely. Uh, we really don't have much information other than what uh, the governor is saying on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, in terms of uh, your, your event itself, I would recommend, and uh, this was really the same, uh, I don't know if you heard my answer to Dell's question, you, you, you probably have a special event policy or at least you have um, a special event coverage within your existing policy. So you should probably look at that policy and find out whether or not there's event cancellation coverage. And that, because, uh, you know, obviously it's a disaster if you have to cancel the whole event. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else? No. Jack? What is the, the chances of the government getting involved um, if the insurance companies decide that they are going to pay out on this? Is there been much discussion with that? Well, it, 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 break that answer into two pieces, Carrie. Uh, what's what's going to happen uh, as a result of what's transpired so far and what's going to happen for the future if we ever have another pandemic like this again? Uh, right now, there is legislation being considered, uh, although Congress hasn't been in session, uh, to create, uh, are you familiar with terrorism insurance? Most, most uh, we're required by law to offer terrorism insurance, which is a government-backed reinsured program uh, that was as a result of 9-11. So after 9-11, Congress enacted a law uh, called TRIA that provided for, uh, for terrorism insurance that is backed by the government. And we have to offer it to everybody on every policy. Uh, so what's being discussed now is a similar, although it would be a much larger uh, program uh, for pandemics. And, and so all of the, uh, the people who buy insurance would be offered the opportunity. This is in its infancy stages, but I, I don't think there's, there's going to be any question that the government's going to have to get involved uh, in, in figuring out what the insurance answers are, because the insurance answers, at least the money, uh, isn't available right now in the marketplace. Um, and if it's going to be made available, it's going to have to be done with the assistance of the government. So I wonder how that will hold up in court. Like, um, I know Victoria's Secret, they were in the process of a sale and they had a pandemic, a pandemic clause and it didn't hold up and that can that sale was actually canceled. Um, and I wonder, you know, what kind of, you know, court safety, I guess we can rely on actually well, being yeah, it, it, and uh, that's a good question, Aaron, and, and, uh, and the courts are going to have to sort all of this out. But right before you came on, I mentioned that there's significant legislation uh, in several states uh, that are, is, is attempting to force the, uh, the insurance carriers to pay under the policies, whether the coverage was written into the policy or not. And then, of course, there's also significant litigation uh, by all kinds of people, but primarily coming from um, the hospitality industry at this point. Uh, the airlines are being subsidized to a degree, but uh, we'll have to see how the litigation sorts out. Um, there are different policies, uh, different types of policies and, and different coverages written into, into each policy, and that's why it's important to review these kinds of things. I know we all kind of got blindsided on this one, but on a go-forward basis, it's something we all have to pay very close attention to. Uh, the, the case that was filed yesterday, I mentioned earlier, 
uh, by legal seafood in Boston against their carrier. Their, their policy was uh, renewed on March the 1st, and it had neither a virus exclusion nor a pandemic exclusion. So uh, that's going to be an interesting one. I'm kind of curious as to why either the agent or the, the carrier didn't bring it up with a March 1st renewal because it was ob obviously something that was on the table. But uh, that doesn't, that really, the, the flip side of that argument is it almost doesn't matter because, uh, it, it, as I mentioned at the very beginning uh, of the conversation, uh, the business interruption coverage is triggered by a direct physical loss to covered property by a covered cause of loss. So a pandemic isn't really a covered peril or a virus isn't a covered peril. So it's, it's, uh, it's really gonna be interesting to see the way the courts uh, adjudicate this. And, and of course, there's gonna be probably some different answers depending on what was written into the policy to begin with. And do nonprofits, I mean, I don't know if Arizona Bull has some type of 501c3 set up, but I know American Heart Association, you know, do nonprofits fall into that kind of um, law? Oh, ab absolutely, probably just as much because of the number of special events. Mm -hmm. yeah, it, I, I would say that the nonprofits are, are as equally uh, covered or not covered, or certainly as equally affected as anybody. And so when you're talking about the special insurance, is this something that would cover people that come to an event and maybe they were already sick or didn't know it, but then got sick when they left or whatever, like a week later they got sick and then they want to come back and say, you know, that they got yeah. sick at our event. So that jumps over to what Dell was asking about the liability side of things. Mm -hmm. the, the business interruption is a property coverage. Uh, then the, uh, uh, what you just described would be a liability coverage. So uh, where's the negligence? Did, did the person have it when they got there or, or did they come and, and become exposed to the virus at the event? And what could the event have done to have prevented someone from attending who had the virus? It's a very difficult question. And it, but liability always, as I mentioned earlier, boils down to negligence. And so negligence has to be proved, proven. Jack, are there specific coverages for events for nonprofits um, that, that, that we can look into for circumstances like that? Well, it, you, well, on the, on the business interruption side, yeah, that's where the event cancellation coverage comes in play. So yes. Uh, and uh, as far as the liability part is concerned, this is, this is new ground. This is unplowed ground at this point. Yeah, that was gonna be one of my questions because I have heard of businesses who were paying into a pandemic uh, insurance policy and got paid out. But that's why I was curious because you know, the chamber, we put on lots of events. I know the Heart Association does and a couple of organizations that I'm a part of. Uh, we have an event that we wanna hold in September as well. And so <clears throat> that's why I was curious, you know, I, I wanna make sure that if we're gonna do it, I'm not really worried about the, the uh, event cancellation. I'm more concerned with holding an event and uh, as Aaron and, and, and Della both uh, talked about, someone getting sick and the liability falling on us uh, for that. So that's why I was curious. Yeah, and, and I think that uh, one of the things that, that uh, all of us need to do is, is sit down with uh, the agent that you're working with and go through the policy, especially before these events, because <clears throat> the liability side, it, it, in terms of the cancellation at this point, it, it, it almost is like insuring a burning building. You're probably not gonna be able to buy event cancellation policy for anything in the next uh, several months unless you already had it. With respect to the liability though, um, that, that's something that needs to be discussed. Uh, everybody needs to discuss that with their agent really right now, particularly in the, in, in the, uh, in the event business. Um, and I guess just, so my history is I used to own a, a company that did events and I had some addendums written into my policies or contracts that people had to sign. And, um, Rod Freeman told me, uh, Rod that's a Freeman. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> 
he told me that um, that was a bullshit addendum, Aaron. Um, it won't hold up in court. And I was like, well, I mean, I think that it just kind of lays the groundwork for people um, to know that if you're going to, you know, be ridiculous. I mean, I had an act of God clause, like if the weather was so horrible and your event didn't happen, like it wasn't, that's not our fault. We're not giving refunds. We'll, you know, do it for an ongoing date, but nothing that we can't help it. So, I mean, are these things that will hold up or do we just not really know yet? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's hard to say from an absolute standpoint, but if, if there is coverage provided and a premium paid, then they should hold up. Now you never know what's going to happen in, in a courtroom, but uh, but if you're paying premium and you have coverage written into the policy, then absolutely it it, it should hold up. I'm going to step away. Thank you so much for your time. Okay, Dal. Good to Thanks see you. We'll be out to you soon. Thank you. Yeah. Take care. How do, how do you? Rod was your attorney. No. Um. So my dad is Ron Paddock. Um. And oh, so you're kidding me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so I grew up with Darcy and Rod and um, Diane um, yeah. as our neighbors. So yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. It goes back a long Where time. Where's your dad now? He's in Phoenix. In Phoenix, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, Adam, what do you do? I work for the Chamber of Commerce, but oh. I am a, I'm a board president for a couple of different organizations. Um, we're having a discussion about a September event right now, and obviously kind of in the same boat as you are. Um, you know, it's, it just doesn't seem like the right time to be talking about this, but at the same time, you know, if, if, if everything looks right, um, you know, it's something we're gonna look into, but I would not feel comfortable um, having an event if there isn't any kind of security or, or coverage for us uh, so that we're not held liable. And I think you know, as we get further down the road, that's going to be interesting because I know, you know, U of A and, and Pima County Health Department of Health and our nation are going to want to get into contact tracing. And once contact tracing uh, becomes more prevalent, you know, I would hate for, for someone to get sick at our event and have that contact tracing show that not only did they get sick at our event, but they got four or five or six or 50 people sick as well. And so that's why I'm curious about, you know, what the liability looks like and how we can cover ourselves and the chamber included, you know, we have thousands of people at our events too, and it's going to be something we're going to have to look into for that as well. Does the chamber carry a, uh, a year round event policy? Special event policy. That would Jason. I, we, <sighs> I would have to check on that. I was never involved with that. Shirley, do you know on that? I, we carry some coverage, but I don't know exactly to what degree. I, I don't know either. I'm not sure what we have right now. It's a good That's question, Jack, and definitely something yeah. that you should look into. Most well, certainly. Yeah. I've had those conversations with Amber. I think that's something that we're going into as well, so. Yeah, it's, it's uh, especially with the type of events that the chamber sponsors, um, it's easy to look to the venue for the coverage uh, because you're paying the venue to provide. But, uh, uh, you know, there's, there also can be some, I mean, there's a certain amount of control that the event sponsor has that, that could lead to liability. So I think, it, I think it's something that, that you should uh, discuss. Um, and and I, I, would, yeah. I would say that uh, that's true of anybody that's having special events. If you have a lot of them, it's it's better to have an annual policy. If you have just a few, it's better to buy it on an on a one-off basis for each event. Well, and I don't think until recent, but you know, we've always had like loss of income or something um, for events. But as far as a virus or a pandemic or something like that, who would have ever thought that could even be an issue today, or the liability of potentially somebody getting ill at an event. I, um, again, that has never really been something that in our history has ever been even thought of before. Um, and then people are at free will to go where they want. So can they really come back and put liability on you? You're not forcing them to be there. You know, it's like a grocery store. If you get sick at the store, are you going to sue the store? I don't know. 
Yeah, it's it, it's it, it's really a, a complicated discussion because uh, obviously there's going to be a lawyer that's going to be willing to take uh, take one side and another lawyer is going to take another side. So yeah, what, what, that precedence that? hasn't been filled yet. You know, it just hasn't. No one's done it yet, so there's not that any precedence to fall back on really yet. But no, not from the standpoint of the liability. Uh, from the standpoint of the of the loss of income, I'm I'm wondering, uh, have you checked uh, to find out if there was any coverage for the uh, cancellation of the state of the uh, city? That's a good question. I'll have to check with Carissa to see if there's uh, again seeing if we carry that kind of policy. That's I guess the, that's the whole point. I Are we going to try to do that later on? Uh, well, the idea was to post, it is postponed, right, Carrie, for now. It's really postponed. We're trying to figure that out, yeah. but it hasn't been canceled. Out. Yeah, how we're going to host it, it may just be different, and it may be virtual, maybe something else um, in partnership, but um, it hasn't been officially canceled at this point. So. Just, yeah, okay. Yeah. Erin, you had another question? No, no, no. I was just saying the precedence was not um, there yet. But it will be interesting. I think... Um, you know, the one thing the Heart Association has done a great job with is um, turning things virtual. We had our first um, virtual heart ball um, in March, and they are where the very, very similar market as to Tucson. Um, Tucson has a very long history with the heart ball. Um, the very first heart ball in the United States was here in Tucson in 1943. Um, oh. And so we have a long history with the heart ball. Um, and anyway, this um, event in South Carolina, within 48 hours, they had to turn it around and make it virtual. They decided to. And um, their goal was 700000 and they raised over a million dollars all virtual. It wow. was just, yeah. I mean, so, and their silent auction, you know, usually a very good revenue for silent auction, like really good, is 30000 Like, that's really good. They did $75,000 in silent okay. auction just for people sitting at home. And so, you know, I think that people, if you can figure out how to do things virtually, the, you know, the desire is there. I do think most events going forward will have to have a virtual aspect to them. Um, there's just no you know, there are going to be people who will not feel comfortable. And are you going to alienate them by not having them be able to attend? And so the true, you know, trick is how do you make money still by people coming virtually? And um, it will be, you know, the sponsorship aspect is different now. You know, a, a sponsorship deck will look different. I mean, we have, um, instead of someone doing the valet, for instance, um, as a sponsorship, they can be the valet for emails. So all emails that go out will have their logo on it um, instead of being the car valet at the event. And so there's just trying to figure out, you know, those different, um, different avenues and figuring out how to still make money in a time where we were all so used to going to things. Um, so will be interesting. And Aaron, I don't, you know, the thing is, it's not exclusive to you or to us or to anybody. It's the new norm out there. And I think if anybody wants to participate and still back and still contribute, um, it is going to be the new norm. And we just, I think people will get used to that and be okay with um, spending that kind of money. And hopefully the loss won't be there as much on the other side or budgets will be adjusted differently, that sort of mm -hmm. thing to accommodate that. But it's not just like it's your events that are changing or it's our events, it is the world's events. Right. Um, and so again, depending on your insurance and how that looks, you may have a loss, but maybe it's not as great because that's just kind of what we're all working into and working with. Um, yeah, yeah. Guys, I mean, some of these events are, are a significant portion of the uh, nonprofit's income for the whole year. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's, it, it really is disaster if anything has to be canceled. I'm on the board of the Boy Scouts and uh, we had our Good Scout luncheon, which was supposed to have been at the end of April. And uh, that's been rescheduled for September 2nd. But now at this point, how good does that look? Right. Jack, what is your average for the Boy Scouts? What is their percentage of events? Is it 30% of the uh, overall revenue of the year, 40%? Well, it's, uh, you know, I don't know exactly, but okay. between 
the Good Scout lunch and summer camp, which has now been canceled. That summer camp is the biggest yeah. event, and that just got canceled last week. Right. Um, but I would say probably 20, 30 percent. And the uh, the camp is probably you know maybe 40 percent. That's standard, and you're right across the board. That's standard for a lot of organizations. So yeah, yeah, Jason, that's but that's that's different than what the Foothills Club is. You know, we are about 75 percent. Um, right. event revenue generated and about 25% on membership dues and other stuff. So we got lucky and were able to sneak in our golf tournament on March 13th or before everything got shut down. But, you know, that was last fiscal year uh, or that, you know, this event's going to be in this current fiscal year. Uh, and it's, you know, we're talking about 35 to $40,000 uh, that we're looking to lose, which for an organization as small as ours, um, that is significant. Um, yes, it is. So, yeah, but like you guys are saying, you know, it's time to get creative and try to find ways to, to still generate revenue and somehow ask these businesses to donate their products, knowing that that's not something that's going to be easy, but then also going out there and asking for money right now is just tough. Um, so that's why we're still looking into it and trying to figure out solutions. But, you know, I would feel better if there was some kind of insurance coverage, but that's, that's why I'm so interested in this conversation. Yeah. Well, um, just Adam, no, though, there are people still working. There are people who, you know, have money coming in still. And um, there are people who really do, I mean, the Giving Tuesday thing, um, really took off and um, it was substantial. I mean, huge donations were made and not just Heart Association, but across the board. I know I donated to four different ones because I was, you know, just little chunks to try and feel like, you know, there was some help there. So um, people still want to donate and are able to, which there are lots of industries that have not been affected. They're just not on social media blaring it from the rooftops because they're trying to have, you know, they're not as loud as I am sometimes, so um, that's okay. <laughs> right. we're, we're fortunate to work for the chamber. So, I mean, um, we are well aware of what's going on out there and willingness and ability to pay. Um, and so it's just one of those things, you know, we're, you know, our, our nonprofit um, benefits youth. So we are any program, any local nonprofit that's local to Tucson that's benefiting youth 18 and under. So there is a lot of need out there. It's, you know, when you're a relatively unknown, I mean, you guys, like you just said, you know, your your organization and your event is a well-known quantity in Tucson. Mine is not, mm -hmm. uh, and so there's a there's a big difference there. And and while I appreciate it, it's just, you know, we want to get to that point, but we're just not quite there yet. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Thanks, Jack. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Any other questions? Anything? Anything? Anybody else wants to discuss? I I, I really thought it was uh, interesting. You said there are people that are working out there, and there are jobs. Um, my son sent me. You know. You know what I think one of the most vibrant businesses is right now, bicycle uh -huh. shops. Oh yeah. The, the my son sent me a uh, a photograph of the bicycle racks at Walmart. It was like fifty yards of empty racks. They're all sold. And then we went. The kids were down a, 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 a few weeks ago, and we went to a couple of bike shops to fr try to find uh, bikes for my two granddaughters. Nothing. Mm -hmm. Bikes are all sold out. Yeah. People are trying to find ways to get outside and get some exercise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the, the grocery stores and big box stores are all looking for people, but one of the problems, and I don't want to get political here, but you know, if somebody's getting their extra $600 a month, to the 240 for the unemployment, the people that are coming back into business now are going to have a hard time getting those employees to come back to work. Right. There's no, well, yeah, don't get political, but there's no drive if they're making more money on unemployment than they were when they were working. I mean, my nephew is making more money not working right now. And I'm like, holy cow, that is, and I'm sure it's great. You know, they, he needed it. Um, but that what will be the push? Why go back to work? Well, you know? I, we, we have we have a client that's a restaurant that got one of the PPP loans, and uh, he started calling the employees and come back to work. You know, we'll do interior maintenance, we'll spiff the place up, we'll clean, and all that kind of stuff. They said, "Nah, I'm good. Yeah, gonna stay home." 
hey, Jack, though I've heard that um, there's some either states or cities, or I'm not even sure what, but if you get the PPP loan and call your employees back and they say no, that is the same as a voluntary quit, so their benefits end. Is that what you've heard, or is that just hearsay? Um, I, I don't know, Adam. I, I have heard that too, but I haven't fact checked it. There, the problem right now is you got to fact check about everything you read or, or hear. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's tough to know what's true and what's not true. And of course, the rules on the PPP uh, are changing daily. I was on a, a call with uh, David Cohen from Beach Fleischman last week, and he, he literally said they check every day to see what the changes are. Mm. That's actually a really good question, Adam. That's something we should even do a little further research into because that's... Well, I, I mean, I would hope that that would be the case. It should be, yeah. Especially if they were... I, there was a, a difference between being furloughed and laid off. Yeah. So if they were furloughed, they continue to get their benefits, I think is the point. So if, if, they're, if they're offered to come back and they say no, then I, I have to guess that what you said is, is right. Yeah. But I haven't checked that. Jack, do you see this um, becoming more of an inter, like it more of a, um, just like its own industry, like uh, pandemic insurance or coronavirus insurance? I mean, is this going to well, be like a new know, norm? The, the interesting thing is, um, uh, is, is twofold. One is, even if it's a government backed program like terrorism insurance, what are going to be the premiums? Because when I mentioned that, you know, that the business income losses uh, are somewhere between 250 and 450 billion per month. I mean, what do the premiums have to be that everybody's going to have to pay in to allow those to be covered, even if the government is subsidizing uh, as a reinsurer, in, in fact? Um, that's one thing. And then the other, the other thing is one of the biggest dilemmas uh, that we're seeing out there now is the conflict between landlords and tenants. Uh, you know, the, the lease is a contract. And so, example, we have a, a client in another state that uh, owns a shopping center, uh, the, the anchor tenant of which is one of these great big uh, uh, gyms that has gone into an old grocery store space. And the, of course, the, the, the gyms had to be shut down. So the, the tenant is saying, I'm not paying the rent. And the landlord is saying, I got a mortgage. And they got a, they got a contract that says he's supposed to pay the rent. You know, what's going what, you know, to be the result? Who's, who's going to take the hit on that? In, in that particular case, one of the subjects we didn't talk about, and I didn't know if anybody was interested, is something called force majeure, where you're put out of business because the mayor says the restaurants have to close down. But if there's a force majeure, and I'm talking about the landlord tenant relationship, if there's a force majeure clause in the uh, contract, that's contractual. That, that really doesn't have to do with uh, a, a trigger that would, that would create insurance coverage for that. A lot of nuances on this subject all over the place. Um, and, and a lot of exposures being, with, with all of us being at home, I'm, I'm actually back in the office now, not this moment, but. Um, we have uh, workers remotely. We ha we've had to bring in our IT guys to make sure that all the connections are secure because the hackers are having a heyday right now because they're, they're able to get into more vulnerable uh, internet connections than, than ever before. So cyber insurance is a big deal. Uh, we didn't talk about that, but cyber insurance is a very big deal with respect to that. Anyway, lots, lots of uh, lots of fallout. Lots going to be a lot of rethinking of about every aspect of our businesses as a result of this. Yeah, your life is going to be changing after this as well, Jack. I'm your sorry, Carrie. I didn't hear you. Your life and your industry is going to be changing for you moving forward as well. No, no question about it, and and certainly there's going to be a dip in the beginning because as our clients um, uh, have fewer sales and less payroll, 
their premiums on their general liability and their premiums on their work comp are going to go down. And so, of course, our commissions are going to go down. We're going to be a little bit lagging the rest of the economy in that dip, but we're, we'll see a dip here pretty quick now in our business. And, and of course, uh, people are going to pay a lot more attention to reading their policies after this than they ever did before. Because it truly, uh, you know, we're... Well, and Go ahead. Okay. Oh, I was going to say, in choosing a trustworthy company and insurance representative as well, because they want to... I mean, I don't know everybody that's going to read their policies, but they want to make sure that if their agent is going to tell them what is in that policy that they want to trust that agent as well. So credibility is going to be huge, I think, for for them as well, for your industry. No, absolutely. The one thing I didn't mention um, in the in the little dialogue or monologue at the beginning was that um, we are asking our clients if they want to file a claim without regard to whether or not we believe there's going to be coverage. And so we are helping a lot of our clients file claims. We're encouraging them to consider that because we just don't know how this thing's going to end up from a litigation and legislation standpoint. If, if there is coverage that's afforded by one vehicle or another, we certainly want our clients to, to, to be in the front row on that. And, and not only that, there are provisions within the policy that require you to file your claim on a timely basis. So certainly right now it's still timely, but I wouldn't want to wait until, um, you know, the carriers are forced to pay if they're going to be forced to pay and, and uh, have it be outside that timely uh, uh, time frame. So uh, I, I would recommend to anybody that thinks they have a claim or that their business has been interrupted, they, they have losses, that they should in fact get with their agent and, and file a claim. That, that's what we are doing. We're filing claims. It's good news to share with our members as well. Yes. Yeah. So thank I mean, you for that. If in doubt, uh, you know, file. I mean, that uh, your agent should be willing to help you do that. And, um, and and you you just want to err on the side of caution, right? Anybody else have any questions for Jack? Well, Jack, we appreciate you uh, taking time out of your busy schedule to uh, speak with us today. Well, you're most welcome. Good A lot to of see great, all of you. Great insight. And uh, if you have any questions of Jack, Jack, what is your email address? Is it Jack at the No, J P Clements. Almost got it. Sorry. JP <laughs> Clements at ClementsInsurance.com. Great, great. Oh, and one of the things I, uh, I can't remember if I mentioned it at the beginning. I think I told you, Jason, but I didn't tell the rest. There are a lot of good uh, uh, portals around. Farhang and Medcoff has a, uh, has a COVID resource center on their website. On our website, we have, which is www.ClementsInsurance.com, we have portals to all of the other so if you go on our website, you can get to Farhang and Medcoff, you can get to the uh, uh, FEMA, you can get to the CDC, you can get to Liberty Mutual Insurance Company and several other insurance companies uh, that will uh, send you straight through to, to all of those resource centers. So there's tons of resources out there uh, that can be taken advantage of. And you can get either to them directly or through, through going through our website uh, uh, to get to the portals. Great. Well, thank you again. Thank you so much for your time. You bet. Good to see yeah, you. Yeah, thanks, Jack. Good right. to see and you. Take care of yourself. Yep. Yeah. Well, everybody, tomorrow, yeah. tomorrow, Edmund Marquez um, from the Rio Nova Board, and also he's a, a board member for the Chamber of Commerce. So tomorrow he'll be speaking about Got our two team. insurance guys in a row. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's speaking on the Rio Nova part of it, the downtown part yeah. of it. And, right. That one's closed, Jason. I couldn't register for it. I'll check it again. Sometimes it shuts down. I'll, I'll get it open again for you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Thank you, everybody. Have a good, good Thank afternoon. You. Yes. Yes. Stay safe. Stay healthy, okay? You too. Take care. Good to see you. Thanks.